and I'm just getting it up and running. I was supposed to just go straight to the Google. There, can we see that all right, everybody? Thumbs up. Yep. Lovely. Welcome this morning. Yes. So, uh, my good friend David and I will talk to you about the Remoto Bayer. So, I thought, as usual, it's probably good to just set a little uh, premise around what it is. So, uh, I don't know what's going on with uh, Google this morning, but it's having some fun. So, we're going to talk to you about the Virtual Bayer. So, Virtual Bayer sits within the, the RAF uh, scheme of things. Where does it sit? Well, as we always say with the, with the virtual obey, it's about radiating information from the organisation to the organisation. Um, we've done a lot of work around this. And of course, it sits within, it sits within our enterprise and our team of teams or, our, uh, or layers. But of course, it can sit at, at your normal team layer, but it informs all of those. And, and we'll talk through that. Um, and remembering, of course, that it's made up of four zones. Uh, that we call uh, Mado's. Mado's being a Japanese word for window. We use that because it really should be a window into that information for your organisation. So it made up of the strategy, the work, the data, and the, the cultural Mado. So in short, Abaya really is, is a big room that acts as a central source of information for your organisation and enables that, enables that autonomy and that alignment and why it becomes so important is, you know, when we were in physicality, we used to do that big rooms. Now we have to think about that in digitality. So the virtual obeyer becomes something that really is integral to allowing us to understand where we're at, what's going on, and being able to pull that information to allow us to make those expedient decisions. So moving forward, Dave and I sort of have a very similar approach. And the way we're going to do this is uh, we'll just run through the approach and how it sits. We'll then talk about some experiences and then uh, some pitfalls, and we'll have a bit of fun about some questions. So feel free to stop us and ask. But um, the way that we always start, we start with the governance, thinking about how we're going to govern our system as a whole. Um, and the system is based on those pillars of radical transparency, intent-based leadership, your system of work and your dynamic analysis. And as you can see by that diagram, there's a black line that runs through it. Uh, and that black line for me represents the uh, virtual obeyer. It links all of that and allows you to inform the information that you need to create that radical transparency to allow you to do that intent-based leadership, to understand what's coming from your systems of work and get that dynamic analysis that underpins everything that you need. Um, when we do that, how do we do that? So one of the approaches that we use here, and Dave will flesh this out very, very uh, more in more depth in a moment, but you know, we use the team of team launch usually to flesh out the things that are needed based on step one, because when we're, when we're launching it there, you have to start at that lab before you can get to the enterprise lab. Um, and then yeah, in Dave's favorite words, you copy and paste and make it into a pretty obeyer. And we'll talk about how you might make that. So that's a, that's a really whistle top. Uh, whistle stop move around how we do it. Now we get into a little bit more of the depth. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the experiences and examples, and I'm going to defer to my good friend, Dave. Thanks, Tony. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, I uh, really creating an obeyer um, with some real life examples. Um, this is the team of teams launch from one of the clients I'm working on um, now. And the next slide down is actual their board that I'm building. Um, for them, they're a bayer um, that we're building for them right now. So as Tony said, I really think of this as a, a three-step process or three-step pattern to try and create an a bayer that is really context-specific to the to the person or the team or the the space that we're working in. Um, the first step, as Tony mentioned, for me is always starting with governance. So because a remote um, agile governance around radical transparency. Um, systems of work, intent-based leadership and dynamic analysis or data um, really, for me, help me understand from the client's perspective or the people I'm working from or the organization's perspective about what's really important for them to um, make transparent, uh, to make visible around obviously how they work, uh, their strategy, how they plug um, and track their work into their data so they're able to make decisions. And when you think about the Abaya, we have the strategy zone, we have the work zone, we have the data zone um, that really 
tie in really well with those sorts of governance things. So I want to start with someone and understand how they want to make things transparent or how they want to make things visible. So that gives me the guidelines or the, the, um, the framework within um, that I'm going to start to capture information into their obeyer. So my first step is always um, start with that governance. How, what do we want to make transparent? Um, how do we want to organize around the work? Um, how will we make this happen? So how are we going to lead? How are we going to manage that? Um, and what do the sources of data look like? Or what are the, how are we going to track value and the like? Once I've done that, that gives me sort of a bit of a grounding for how I want to approach creating it. And then I've really got two options. I can go off and do it myself. Um, my natural way of working with people is to facilitate the conversation and let them fill the space. As in, I often say to people, I'll never know your context better than you do. So why should I tell you what to do? Um, so for me, it's often a really, um, I need to find a really collaborative way of sort of to generate a lot of that information. And one of the things I've found over the last 18 months is the team of teams launch, as Tony said, um, becomes really useful tool for, for two reasons. One, to build that alignment piece with the teams and the teams of teams, um, help them understand their context, help them build social contracts, help them um, talk around how they're going to govern and how they're going to deliver value. But it provides such a really good um, opportunity to gather information, gather data um, that we can actually port across to the virtual obeyer. So things like when we talked about transparency, things like, all right, their strategy zone. So how do they do strategy? Where do they do it? What's their governance? Um, what's the environment they work in? Um, their system of work is how their teams interact. Um, what's their workflow? Um, how do they want to track improvement? Um, we start talking about success measures in the team of teams launch as well, which is really good for us to start talking about um, what data we need to capture, how we want to track value. So I find that the team of team launch really is a, a strong basis for generating a whole bunch of information. And once I've done that, as Tony, if you want to jump to the next slide, once yeah. I've done that, what I tend to do is I've got a really big team launch, which tends to be incredibly messy. Um, and what I do is I start to build out a virtual obeyer. So I've done this one in Miro because um, I seem to be doing a lot of work in Miro. But what you can really see from this one, the team launch you saw on the previous slide, this is the actual, that's actually generating information for this obeyer. And this one's a work in progress. Um, but what you can kind of see is you can see the four main um, sections of the obeyer being the strategy on the top left. Uh, underneath that's the work zone. Um, on the right, um, up the top, you've got the data zone and down the bottom left, uh, the bottom right is the culture zone. So in strategy, we're really taking the time to build their roadmap, show how their roadmap breaks into their, um, into the three teams. This team of teams has three teams. So the, in the strategy zone on the top, um, top left, you can see a large 12 month, uh, excuse me, three year roadmap that they're filling in. Um, and then underneath that, the 12 month detailed roadmap for each of the, the three teams. From that, we've taken down and broken it under, into that into their work zone and built them a Kanban. They want to operate in a Kanban manner. Um, so in the work zone, you can actually see their this quarter. So we've taken their work for this quarter and actually helped them track across the three teams. Um, this helps us keep really strong alignment all the way up to their strategy roadmap as well. So if I could zoom in on the Kanban, uh, it's client work, so I can't really do that. But if we could zoom in on the Kanban, you would see the swim lanes of the teams. Um, but we've color coded the work packages based to their strategic um, initiatives. So we can actually track that all the way up to the, to the um, team of team strategy. In the work zone, we've also got things like their calendar, um, how, they're in, um, how they're keeping in sync with each other. And I know Phil's on here, so I'll give Phil the credit that he deserves. Um, in there, just to the left of the Kanban in the work zone, Tony, if you want to float your mouse over it, is actually my um, continuous improvement um, board. And that's as a coach, I'm in there helping them improve their ways of working. So I actually reflect um, their Kanban way of working and how I work with them so they can actually see how we do things, um, see how I sort of model that behavior and, and track the, um, the things that I'm doing as I go through. So a little bit of credit out to one Phil Gazinski who gave that tip to me oh, maybe two or three years ago now. My pleasure. I'm glad you remembered, Dave. Yeah. Credit where credit is. finally mate. works. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Something stuck. <laughs> um, the data zone is basically that. So in the team of teams launch, I started talking about how do we show success to the organization? What's success look like to the organization? They are two different things. 
um, what success look like as a team of teams for us? How do we show success? Um, and obviously, how do we show success at the team level? And, and, that, and that's actually starting to build out the data zone. So again, you can see some of the data has been plugged in as we're creating it and gathering it and generating it. Um, those yellow circles, bit of a trademark of mine, if you're ever in a workshop that I'm running, um, they're actually the answers from um, how they want to capture data. So what we've done is just segmented it into um, customer data, um, organizational data, team health, um, and these guys do benefits, really good benefits tracking and insights. So the data they're getting from the work they're delivering. And the culture zone is really just the repository for two parts. For me, it becomes the, the, their agreements on their culture. So their governance values, their social contract, uh, their decision delegation. So who's making decisions and what, I find that really important to make really clear and have that in the abaya. So we've got that visible link, how the teams interact and their roles and responsibilities. And then one of the things I always build in there is a, is a collaboration space, which is free for anyone to use in the abaya um, to collaborate together across teams in a remote setting. So for me, that's the sort of the highlights that I go through when I create them using the team of team launch to generate it. Um, in this context, um, this is a digital team, a team of team, digital team of teams. So we have anyone from the head of digital in here. Um, it's used for the leadership team when they're talking and doing their strategic planning plus their tracking of work. Um, <clears throat> I believe the head of digital takes this out to um, some of her peers across her organization um, to, to share that and show that information really clear. Um, and we actually have individuals from the team. So the SMEs um, in who are actually doing the work coming in and using this as well to track their work and see what's going on and also start to um, start to capture their space for the collaboration. So that's kind of um, how I go around creating it. So Tony, I might yeah. get back to you. I think, Dave, I think one of the things to talk about there, just, you know, we make this a little conversational, but um, I sat in on with you on, on these workshops. And one of the things that I like about this approach and, and talk to you is, is that you're actually you're using the system of governance as, a, as a, an anchor to think about what they're trying to achieve. Did, did you want to talk a little bit about that? Because I, I, that was the first time we'd really used that, that approach in some of, some of the new stuff that we're doing in the governance in there. Yeah. Um, Tony, really start with, understanding, I think I mentioned it before, but really start understanding about where they want to go. Um, I think how we plug, um, how we want to govern our system and our goals and our strategy um, and the value of what we're trying to create become really critical in trying to plug together what we want to show. Um, there's nothing, for me, there's nothing more useless than building, would be building a virtual abayer that doesn't help us sell the message that we want to sell. Um, internally within Elaborate, I'm a consultant at Elaborate, uh, for those who didn't know. Um, one of the things I always talk to our guys about is you gotta, you got to remember the message that you're trying to sell. So the journey that you're trying to sell or the message that you're trying to portray. And I think an abayer, in a sense, can be very similar is you want it to tell you something. Um, and the governance for me really helps us sit down and pull down to the values about well, what do you actually want to do? What does it mean for you? What do you stand for? Um, what are the values you want to create? So with this space, we spent a bit of time just generating their governance values, which are actually captured on this board. They're in the culture zone. Um, and we can actually tie back to that really quickly. So we can actually say, are we, are we presenting and being transparent about what they want? One of their governance values was they wanted to really ramp up their transparency, yeah. uh, make things visible. Um, they wanted to be incredibly customer centric and customer focused. Um, and that enabled us to start thinking about, well, what are the things in our abaya that we need to show to be transparent? So when we did the, um, some of the governance, governance mapping exercises, Tony, which I'm sure you can talk about in much more detail than I can, we started talking about, well, what are the things you need to have in place to be transparent? Um, yeah. For instance, so they said we wanted to make our strategy transparent. We wanted to make where we're at with our work transparent. We wanted to make um, how we're improving transparent. We wanted to make... Um, our budgets and things along these lines. I haven't got the budgets in here just yet, but that may be something that's coming. Um, they're the decisions they made. Um, and those decisions really help me understand, okay, if you want to make these transparent and we're building an abaya, let's make sure we've got sections for that or we can really show that and actually drive that home. Um, 
things like customer centricity, that's why we've got the customer metrics and the customer data in the data zone so they can actually see it and be really transparent with it. Um, we included benefits tracking because they wanted to see the value of what they were delivering. So not just delivering a piece of work and fire and forget, actually going back and saying, are we seeing this impact the customer's experience? Are we seeing this improve how the customer wants to work? Are we seeing um, the benefits that we set out to achieve in the first place? So yeah, the governance for me becomes the bedrock or the guiding principles. Um, that lets me then use the team of teams launch to pick the right data out of the team of teams launch or the information the right team of teams launch to bring across. Um, and the sort of the four windows of the abaya become uh, uh, an empty space for me to play in. And then I basically just create spaces within each zone to, to fill in, to make sure they're getting the gov um, getting fill in with the information from the team of teams launch that answers the questions or says, helps them do the things that they want to do from a governance perspective. Yeah. yeah and I think yesterday um, I had the opportunity to chat with them as we're part of the guides course that we're running with also some of those. Um, people in that particular, and you can see if anybody's listening or watching this, the, the, the thing that was affirmed and the tip, tip for you out of that is the governance mapping. We won't go into that today, but I, suffice to say, I'll just use this as a little platform to say, watch this space as we release some new stuff around the, the governance and the governance mapping that we were able to test and use with this particular um, client. Uh, in creating those values, they felt that those the, the governance values that they, they honed in on became the anchors that every time they started to think about, sh should we go to this way? They'd go, okay, does that align with those values? And brought them back and gave them some really good focus. So it was really good work. And it was, it was good to see um, Dave interacting with them in that way. So we, um, we might move on from there, Dave. Yeah, mate, let's do it. Cool. All right. So I'm just going to do a little bit about um, my current client uh, who will remain nameless for, to, to protect the innocent, of course. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a different tack today. So obviously we do a lot of work and we use Miro and we use a lot of digital tools and, and those types of things. One of the questions I get asked quite a bit, and I, and I know the rest of the team does, is how do you handle it when you don't have access to those things? You've got to work with the tools that the client themselves have, right? So the particular client I'm in, um, they do not have access and do not intend to give access to the types of things like Miro or Mural or those digital type boards. Um, how do you create an obeyer? What do you do? Um, the method's still the same and working through it in, in exactly the same way. Sometimes it's a little different. So I'm just gonna sort of take you a little bit through it. With this particular client, the tools we had access to were Jira and its dashboards, Confluence and its dashboards. So if you haven't run across those, that's your Atlassian suite, right? Um, you could you can do the same or similar things with Azure and its suite of stuff from the Microsoft, but these were the ones that we had. Um, and I'm just going to sort of talk about how we use it and who's using it. So first thing for me, this uh, the reason I wanted to show this. Um, a, a few people who, who have seen this. This was really for me, um, when I was first doing this stuff quite some time ago. So, you know, the, the, the instance of the obeyer as we evolved and brought it to life came from the physical obeyer. Uh, whenever I created a, an obeyer, this was my scratch map and it still runs pretty clean today against many of the things that we talk about. Um, and so I, again, pulled this thing out as, as we're starting to do this with this particular client, because it's um, where I first started doing this in the first place, I'm back helping them. And if you look at it, you know, you've got this, you've got all these types of things, but the reality is those zones of what they want and the information they need to absorb and then just ticking it off with them. So again, I, did, I didn't have access to the Miro boards and I couldn't use the team team to launch per se. So this is my, my scratch map that allows me to have those conversations with them. Okay. You know, you want to understand your cost, you want to understand your time, your people, the scope. And we pretty much was ticking all of those off. Um, the cost one is one that, that people don't use a lot. Um, and I know that Dave's got that in there, which is quite good. But always think about how you're going to show what it's costing you to run in some shape or form, if it's project-based or it's operational-based, where are those metrics that allow you to understand very quickly what you're spending and where you're going to be? If you look at this particular burn-down chart, that's a, what we call a prognost, prognostic burn-down chart. Why is it that? Because it tells you where you are and it shows you the projection of where you're going to be. 
if you keep going that way, and then the dollars tell you how much it's going to be for those extra sprints to actually do that, right? So it's very, very important in that, that instance that you, you, you are able to understand what any of those decisions are that are going to cost you as you go. Scope, obvious. Customer satisfaction, again, you know, even back then I was thinking about the health of, of, of our customers. I was thinking about the health of our people so you can see from team satisfaction, et cetera. So moving on. When we got around to the nuts and bolts of it, the tools that we had were things like this. So what did we do? Um, we were doing a number of things here. This is a very short, <clears throat> excuse me, very short cut down of, of what I can show you because of the sensitive data. But this is all done using JIRA and using Confluence. So the data primarily is created within JIRA. And we get all of the teams to actually, at their levels, input the data, <coughs> excuse me, in a structure that, that allows us to drag that information up into boards. We use the, we, we've used the advanced roadmap tools of JIRA to allow us to see the roadmaps. And then because it has a, a, an instance of being able to be used within Confluence, we drag it across into these Confluence dashboards where they can see that information. Now, it's nowhere near as pretty as the stuff Dave's done but it's functional and it allows that information. So when we're running our team of teams, or as they call it, tribe of tribes, or your portfolio standups, they actually have this information there and able to talk to it. The leaders can look at it. So it's being used at both, you know, the tribe or, or team of teams layer, it's used being used at the enterprise layer to bring the information in, right? So if I just give you a little run through those zones very quickly, that's not all of them, but of course some of them I just couldn't put in here because of the sensitivity. But for example, if you, you look at our, over on the left-hand side, you'll see the temperature gauge, that actually gives you the information that you want from your teams. It's a quick, short pulse of how those teams are running and should we do something or should we help them, right? And you can see it's pretty obvious if it's in the amber or it's in the red, you should be really starting to think about it. If it's in the green, you're happy. If it's in that neutral space, then you need to do something to keep accelerating it the right way. It will give you the historical uh, data as well. So that's really important. So you can see how you're tracking. At the bigger levels, it'll roll up and give you a whole list of those, dash, those, those dashboards, right? Which show you all the teams in, in one go on the tribes. Risks, very important for us is to roll those risks up so that you can see them and do something with them really quickly, right? So the big things that I concentrate on a lot of these enterprise organizations in their obeys is so that you can understand the killers of work, your dependencies, your risks, and your blockers. And you can see that we've raised these up here, typical old uh, risk matrix, but that's coming straight live out of JIRA, being propelled up from all of the teams so that you can actually see it and deal with it in real time. So this is the, the important thing here. The information you're seeing here is real time. That means that you can actually make expedient decisions based on the stuff that's actually happening as quickly as you can. You can also see here that with this particular organization, we're using OKRs and we all understand where they're tracking to their OKRs, right? I've obviously cleaned it all out and just put the statuses in there. But normally what we would see is right across, we would see the different statuses of the OKRs. And that's something that people don't do a lot. Think about using those OKRs and propelling those through your abaya because that gives you that understanding of your strategic in, uh, uh, intent and that link to your delivery and how people are actually understanding and tracking with it so that you can, you can intervene when necessary or you can see where you're moving or if you're getting the value from whatever you're delivering. Um, of course, dependencies is pretty obvious, but you really want to see those dependencies because dependencies is the killer of work, right? There is no doubt about that. So the more you can see those dependencies, the more you can have leaders make decisions. Much like Dave, up in the right-hand corner, that task list, what's that about? Well, that task list is nobody gets away without actions, right? So when we get to actually thinking about using this to inform at our team of team stand-ups and our enterprise stand-ups, if we have things here, somebody owns them, somebody deals with them, somebody uses them. And that way we are ensuring that we're actually helping the organization to get where it needs to go. So I guess the long and the short of it there is that you can do this with any kind of tools, right? They're pretty rudimentary tools when you think about it compared to some of the things that you have available. It's just stopping and thinking outside of the box and saying, what can we use with the organization? 
engaging the right people just as they did. You can use the same methods in the same workshops. You just may need to pass them a little differently. Um, you can use the templates. I use the same templates to, to extract the information out of them, but that's essentially the way that we want to, we want to work with them. Um, I might just pause there for a moment before we, we hit the pitfalls and challenges and, and ask if there's any questions there before we, we roll into the pitfalls and challenges. Um, I'm not able to see the chat. So John, maybe you can help us with that if there's anything in the chat that's asking questions or anybody's got questions. Uh, there was one question in there around the use of Azure DevOps from Phil. Yes, Phil. So anything that I've done uh, that, that I've created there, you could you could use in the same in Azure. It, it, it has the same capabilities. You just have to look at it in different ways, but it creates dashboards. Um, how you extrapolate that across into to different mechanisms, you can create wikis, you can use SharePoint. Um, Don't use SharePoint. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I have done that, right? So it just depends on the tools that you want to use and how you want to do that. I've, um, yeah, sorry, um, Tony. I, for, for those on call, um, a, lot of, a lot of the people we're using is Jira, um, obviously, but Rally, if you're using Rally, Rally dashboards and pull, you can pull data from. Um, Azure DevOps does it as well. Um, Phil, I know we worked, when we did some work together, we worked with a client that used Azure DevOps. Um, and I've actually recently, or not so recently, rolled off a client who is using the um, work tracking module out of ServiceNow. Um, so for those who know ServiceNow is a service management platform, so incidents, problems, and changes. Um, knowledge database, they actually have a, a work tracking Kanban um, module that plugs into ServiceNow and it does something similar. So all the tools sort of, those sort of, market leading tools now um, include a lot of the metrics, a lot of the dashboards. Um, they're displayed in different ways, but the capabilities there, if you're, if you're using that tool, you can pull that out, yeah. We've also actually got another question from uh, Paul cool. Gown. Uh, great to have you here, Paul. Uh, how important is it to ensure Jira is configured and enabled correctly? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, all I can answer this with a simple statement and it's early in the morning, but the, the proverbial S in means the proverbial S out. Right? So um, <clears throat> your tools are as strong as the data that you put in um, and the behaviors that are associated to them. Um, if you're using an abaya or any reporting for that matter to make decisions, um, and you don't have any idea or your data in there is not accurate. Um, I was talking to one of my colleagues earlier this week around some of the challenges they've got with making decisions based on incomplete or incorrect data. And ultimately, as, as we all know, um, you, if you're using data, which we do encourage use data to make decisions, but if you're using data to make decisions and that data's wrong, you're gonna be making poor decisions. So yeah. it's really important that whatever tool you use is set up and configured to support what you wanna do. Um, the behaviors around maintaining the data um, accuracy are there. Um, and at some point you probably wanna be looking at that data to make sure it's continuously up to scratch, no, not auditing or data cleaning per se, but yeah, you definitely want to make sure it's set up properly and it's, you're, you're capturing it and showing it the right way. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to take it even one step further and be a little stronger than Dave. Um, and the, re <laughs> the reason I'm going to be a little bit stronger is because I'm dealing with it on a regular basis in different organisations, okay? So you, the, the, I think the worst thing that I, I hear when, you, when you're with organisations that are trying to do this, get enterprise roll up, um, they're doing transformations is that the teams just need to work in the way that they need to work and you just need to let them run. When you're in this kind of frame and you're working in an enterprise frame, you have to be prescriptive about some things, prescriptive versus descriptive, right? And in this instance, <clears throat> you need to be prescriptive about how certain things are set up, right? So if in terms of what you're saying, yes, you're correct. You need to have the same work breakdown in the same ways that's used across the organization to allow that to work. There's still a factor of those things being different things to different teams. That's okay. How you configure your Jira 
instances to allow that information to roll up definitely has to be standardized. So it doesn't have to be normalized, right? Standardization is not evil. And so some people look at that and go, oh, we shouldn't standardize anything. Well, that's wrong. Standardization is your friend when you're trying to create an enterprise mechanism to understand the ability to work. You know, what you don't want to do is normalize that, right? And say that team is exactly the same as that team because an operation is not the same. But you do need to do that. So you need to be prescriptive about how that's done. Um, have those standardized mechanisms that teams have to do and ensure that that does so the data flows up in the same way. So, so I think probably equal stage S in S out, but you know. <clears throat> Tony, I think um, using the example of the, the board that we had, and we we're talking about governance, one of the governance values that that, that leadership team created was, um, I think it was the wording they used was empowerment with bounded autonomy. Yep. If that makes sense. Um, and I think of exactly what you just said there is that bounded autonomy. In your, in your world, you're free to do what you want, but within the bounds of the structure that we needed to put in place. And things around the lines of um, not how you would deliver work, um, but they wanted to be very clear on what we're working on. Um, they want to be very clear on sort of standardized cadences and things along those lines. Um, they wanted to be really clear on um, how they tracked and showed and you, what data they used to, um, to talk about, um, to make the decisions they wanted to. So I think that kind of helped build the, the framework or the guiding rules around how those teams would work. And I think that lands in, Andrew, with your question a little bit, how do you handle it when agile teams push back on the standardization? Well, the leaders themselves were involved with generating the governance values for us and go generating and running the team of teams launch. So the leaders were the ones that were making the decisions or working closely on how to do that and building that agreement. Um, you start with that, with a really collaborative approach, um, let the teams have buy-in through their leadership or through their representatives into that. So they get um, visibility of how that's going to work. And yeah, you'll get pushback and ultimately it's, it's the option to say, look, this is, this is sort of the way we need to work. Um, this is the benefits and reasons behind it. Um, here's why we want to do it. Helping people understand the reasoning behind why we need to do it is one of the first steps I always find that helps with that pushback. Um, but right. you deal with people. So some <laughs> people will like it and others won't. Um, yeah. I, I think, Dave, too, to <clears throat> just final entry to that is, is that, Always providing, as you have done in in oh. the that you've created, is always creating that mechanism of continuous oh. improvement. Oh, for breakfast. <laughs> I'll have breakfast as well, please. <clears throat> is providing that that continuous improvement mechanism that allows you to um to say yes, we've put this in place, but there is a mechanism here for us to look at this and, and improve this. So if it's not working, you know, it's not totally set in stone, right? It's just that we can't have everybody running off and doing all those separate things. There's got to be a mechanism to bring to, to converge that so that we do that so that it works best for the organisation. Yeah, I think if you tie into sort of that, think of roles and responsibilities as a really negative, very structural thing, but it may be something as simple as having an agreement that the leadership team or the strategy implies the epics. I think epic feature user story just for people out there. Um, so the strategy implies the epics that we're working on that get routed to the team. But once the epic hits the team, the team has in the product owner, if you've got that traditional scrum set up, um, have full autonomy to break that epic down, to write the features, to write the user stories. So you know, organizing, do you want to run Scrum? Do you want to run Kanban? Do you want to run Scrum Band? Do you want to run fill the stairs, tap dance? That's cool. Doesn't really the method, well, really the math, the method you want to use. Um, but from a leadership perspective, we need to make sure you're working on things that are strategically important for us. So we hold that decision-making um, and the rest we empower the team. Um, one of the other pillars, I talked about transparency in data and systems of work when it comes to remote governance, but the other one is intent-based leadership. So you need to be really clear about the decisions that you're making, you're holding at the leadership level, um, really clear about the decisions that you want the teams and individuals to make. And obviously you want to push as many decisions as you can down as close to the information being um, down to the individuals, but you still want to maintain and make it really transparent, really clear about the decisions that need to be made and maintained to that leadership um, space. And, as Tony said, 
yeah, you continually review it, you continually track it, you continually make adjustments um, to, to support that. And linking that all back, so, you know, it seems like we've got a little tangential there, but linking that back, the actual act of creating the obeyer and the mechanisms that we've described, whether it be the tools I'm using or, or Dave's using, the actual act of creating the obeyer and thinking about the information that you need to operate as an organisation, you can see that spans out actually into your system of work, into thinking about your leadership and thinking about the data that you need. So you can see the intrinsic link that it has. So... Don't just think of the obeyer as this, as this manual thing there that you're going to do so that you can get information. It actually has an effect on everything that you do. Might move on from there. What's coming soon? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, sorry. What's coming soon? So You've okay. jumped the pitfalls, mate. You yeah. If for some reason, it, uh, it took a little jump and I can't get it to go back. So there we go. Pitfalls, challenges. Uh, it's going to do that, Dave. So we'll just play games with it. <laughs> we love the technical world. Look, so so what's coming soon? Um, I, I wanted to take that moment and what's coming soon just to let you know, and we, we, we preempted that a little bit, that we, the RAF team, have been working with the, with the, the lovely Esther Derby um, and thinking about how we span out our governance modules and thinking more around that whole system of governance and how that links in with the Obeya and the, the Obeya launch canvas. So we're working hard on those and you'll be seeing those, those released and information coming out about that very soon. Um, so an actual launch canvas that helps you actually think even more about what you're gonna put into the Obeyas, um, which you would see with what Dave's doing there, you would link into that. In, in the stuff that Dave was doing, we already tested some of that. So uh, we'll, be, we'll be bringing in that governance mapping, which allows you to think about those values um, and a, a number of modules that work across those, those different things that we have that click into all the other pieces that we have within the RAF environment. Anything else you wanted to, to, to bring up there, Dave? Yeah, I was going to more sort of around some of the challenges and pitfalls, and it might tie into what you're asking there, John, from giving organisations to find the balance between delivering value and effort and maintaining that. Um, I really break virtual obey down into some, some of the four main things. So for me, I, I tend to do this a lot with everything, but I always think about starting, if I'm building an obeyer, I want to start with the end in mind. So I want to know what people want to know. I want to know what they want to see. Um, that helps me later, if that makes sense. So we talk about continuous improvement. Well, if you, you know the end game you're looking for, you're actually on the right path. You're not doing something and then getting them to review it and having to make big changes. If you just take the time to ask them up front, um, a lot of the time that'll save you um, a lot of effort. And if you're running, if you know that before you do the team of teams launch, you can actually make sure that the team of teams launch is generating the information in those certain areas that they're going to want to show anyway. Um, be fast and grow. Um, I hate gold plating. Maybe I'm lazy. Maybe I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> Tony's going to hate me for this. And our Atlassian practice definitely hate me for this. But sometimes it's just easier to start with a virtual board. Oh, yeah, you no, can edit can... a virtual board a lot. You can move things around. Absolutely. You can make changes. You can adapt it really quickly. Go back to, to Paul's question around configuring Jira. If you start in Jira, if you start in a digital tool, you have to configure it. It takes time. And if you need to make a change because the configuration is wrong, it's actually a lot harder to do. Absolutely. So if you use a virtual tool, sometimes that's easy. You will grow out of it, though. That's the, the caveat. You'll get up and you'll get it running really quickly, and then you'll start talking about integrations into systems. You'll start talking about real-time data. Um, one of the ones I'm talking about with the board I showed you guys is, hey, if I move this piece of work here, will it update the rest of my board? My answer is no, unless I go and do it <laughs> for you. Um, so you, you start to grow out of it. Um, for me, and this is another one, um, it's probably about my, present, my presenting skills as well, is you want to be specific. More data and more information is not always the right thing. Um, you want to make sure you're making the important things visible. Um, so if you can own, don't show 100 things when only five things are important, you'll lose the message from the noise. Um, and the last one that I always think of, I don't know why it says three, that should say four at the bottom, <laughs> maybe 3.1, three um, is really know your audience. Um, we talked about before about who's using your abaya. 
if you're a buyer is geared towards the um, executive and the executive are the ones they're using it. So it needs to look like an exec, it needs to support executives looking at it. Um, if you want it to be a playground for your people, then you start building in collaboration spaces. You start building in um, areas where the people on the ground who are doing the work are actually using it. Um, and, and the board or the buyer itself will, will look differently. Um, if it, you're going to do all three, then or as many layers as you like, be really careful about how you organize the spaces. Um, because what happens is you don't want, again, you don't want an executive looking at where people are just playing and thinking and vice versa. You don't want to be use the playing and thinking sort of ways of doing things on a, in an abaya if that's the space that you're going to be presenting back to the executive as well. So knowing your audience, what they want to see, how they want to see it becomes really critical. Because again, we're, what we're trying to do is radiate information and we want to radiate it in a, way, in a way that's going to be consumable for everyone, but in a way that also helps people at their level make the decisions they need to make. Um, so they're my sort of key challenges or key pitfalls and things to be really aware of. And I think, yeah, yeah as, you, as you said, virtual board's great if you have access to it. So if you don't, then they're the, they're some of the things I told you about today were useful. Um, <clears throat> I think building on, on, on what Dave, I concur with everything, obviously, Dave. Um, organizational transparency will be the thing that we will often find as a challenge when you when you come along to do this, right? Because the ingrained that we don't share this information will be one of the hottest topics. Um, and yes, some of that information you can't share because you may have legalities you know merger information or board information and that's fine but it's also being transparent about why you can't share that information right so be transparent about the information that can't be shared but it's actually challenging the norms and i think if you start at that governance layer and you work through the mapping of the governance and then up applying those values there, there are strong conversations and i've had those strong conversations recently where you where the information needs to be shared and it's, it's, it actually starts a good conversation as to why we didn't do it. And, and sometimes it really comes down to it's just the way that we always did it. And they built rules upon rules upon rules upon rules. It's breaking those layers down. So you can see the whole conversation about moving to a, a virtual barrier is a very intrinsic piece of actually transforming the way you work in remote. Just remember everything that you did when you were working in that, that physical environment now is exacerbated in the digital environment, right? So you're working and living in, the, in, in, in digitality. You need that information at your fingertips to be able to extrapolate it, make those expedient decisions or ask the right information or allow people to understand their bounded autonomy as we talked about so they can get on with the work. And ultimately that's what we're trying to do. There's a question, Tony, in the, um, in the chat around advice you'd give to organizations trying to find the balance between delivering value and effort and the effort involved in maintaining the quality of data. Um, I'm probably not the right one to answer this, but I might go first in a sense that I often, I often answer this with a question about, and it's usually around how do you know that you're delivering value? Uh, yeah. exactly. and, and the answer that becomes... <laughs> You're talking about, well, we're trying to find the balance and we're delivering value. Well, how do you know you're doing? How do you know you actually are delivering value? And then they'll go, well, we've got to do this, this, and this, and said, well, then how do you know your data is accurate? Or how do you know your data is um, the quality? You can trust the data. And that starts to branch out um, how, how much we sort of need to put effort in. It's a really hard question to answer because it depends on what they're delivering in. What they, how they make, use the data to make decisions and the like. But usually, John, to answer your question with another question, I would go, how do you know? How do you know? And the balance is do enough with the data to make sure it's accurate enough that you know you're delivering value. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I concur. They're the kind of questions I ask as well. Uh, I think, you know, when you, when you get that effort versus uh, value, though, <clears throat> I think there's three parts of that conversation. Um, is it effort you really want to stand or is it efficiency versus the value you're delivering? And often they mistake the two, right? You can put a lot of effort in, it's output out over, over outcome, right? 
So it's understanding, are we efficiently doing that? And what can we do to continually improve that? And is the value that we're delivering what's actually useful to our customer? So there are a number of ways of putting that in so that you're measuring the right things. Um, and often they don't have those measures. I, I've been in organisations who are delivering stuff and the staff know exactly what they're delivering out there is not being used by anyone, right? So have we got the right measure? So, um, and as we always talk about in, in the, that's why, why in, a, in the Obeya, we include the data analysis piece of it, right? Is because you want to make sure to Dave's point that you have the right data. And the close, closer you can link it to the system, the better and have the source system information coming through. But the secondary part of that is, is there's, there's no supplant for actually the people who are doing the work. So I always use the lean model of close in person, place and time. Whenever I'm thinking about how do we, how are we delivering value most efficiently with minimal effort is what I try to apply is I talk to the people, right? And it's, you know, the people who are closest to the work in person, at the time, right? And then you, you bring that back to, are we delivering the right things and are we delivering the right value? I hope that helps. Other questions? We must have outdone ourselves though. Or scared everyone, Tony. One of the yeah. two. <clears throat> One of the two. I think we might be good. I think we might be done. I might hand back to, to John. This is Sheila. I do have a question. Do you ever get resistance from people in, in actually using these tools? Um, yes and no, Sheila. Um, which is a very political answer. <laughs> um, yes, in a sense um, that if they're using something, why do I need to do something? Why do I need to do something else? Um, and one of the things I often find is people go, hey, well, I'm using say Jira to track my work. Why do I need to now put it in here or do it over here? Um, what I try and do with that then is when we're creating the Abaya, trying to make sure that... Um, it's, it's as simple or as easy or as less duplication of effort as possible um, to try and make sure that people see that we're not actually trying to double up their workload. Um, so that's the, the first one I, I often, the most common one I often run around with is, well, hang on, I'm using this tool over here. Why, do I, why are you making me do something else over in this space? Um, the, the, approach I often, the approach I try and take is to try and overcome that. I think um, just from personal experience and maybe I'm on a on an island by myself on this one but um, I think change management is one of the hardest things we do in organizations it's one of the things we do really poorly as well um, I know a lot of change managers are very good at their job it is very 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 hard to do um, one of the things through my experience in my sort of education study around change management is really that people themselves are not opposed to change what they're opposed to is not um, is like a top-down change that's in, pushed upon them um, and one of the ways I try and be really um, collaborative in overcoming that challenge is by bringing the everyone that I can on the journey with us. So everyone's got a little bit of an input. Everyone's got a little bit of buy-in. Everyone's got a little story to tell that they can, and they can see in the out the outcomes. They're part of the part of the picture. They're part of the story. Or we hear their concerns, and we try and do what we can to overcome it. Um, which I, I think through my experience. And like I said, maybe I'm on the island by myself here, but um, mm -hmm. really helps overcome some of those challenges that come through. Um, but yeah, the pushback really becomes for me a lot of the time I'm doing it here. Do I need, to, why do I need to do it here? And it's becomes two stories. <clears throat> why are we building the Abaya and how are we using it? And what are we, how are we asking them to use it? And what, what are all the things we can do to make sure that we minimize any duplicate of effort? So, uh, duplication of effort so um, integration so what they what's in their space is automatically updated into the buyer and things along these lines um i hope that helps i don't know tony you want to expand yeah. on that you yeah, know I, I would concur I, I mean one of the first things i do when i much like dave is i talk to the people right and, and often it's it's the first step that i take is those that want the information 
uh, I ask them if what is it they're not getting that they need, right? Um, one of those leaders just a little while ago basically said to me, you know, that team over there is doing apples, that one's oranges. I go in there, I don't even know what the hell they're talking about. And then they all have these different dashboards and I don't understand what's on any of those. So when you hear that kind of thing, that's a really good call to action. Now, I could just take that leader and say, okay, well, what do you need? Good. And then I can tell the teams what to do. That's not going to get me where I want to go. So much to Dave's point of view is bringing those people together and explaining what he's looking for and how we want to put that into a central place where he can just see that at a glimpse rather than have to come into the team. The conversation actually turns on its head quite often because the teams themselves are actually the ones that help you come up with the solution. So to Dave's point, it's having the right people in there. Make sure, again, it's that apply that close in person, place and time, right? Closest persons to the place where the work gets done at the time can tell you how usually to get the right information that you can propel up and, and, and help them with what they need to get. Then the second thing about that is, is making sure that it's useful. So I've seen a number of these obeyers created and they're just fanciful. The information on them is not useful to anyone. So that if there's one really hot tip, exactly what Dave said, start off simple and make sure that the information up there is the actual hot topics that you need to get value, right? And that's why you saw me showing that one where around the dependencies, the risks and the blockers. I know that sounds like pretty rocket science stuff, right? But actually that's when they see value because the conversation starts happening about how they deal with stuff. Then they, then they, then you can have that premise and that platform to go, okay, now maybe we can start to bring some of that other information. in. And often they're the ones who are asking for it. I hope that helps. Tony, which they did you mean in the second? I used the, they was uh, the plural pronoun used a few times. I just I just use that as they as, as the collective Anthony. <clears throat> uh, yeah, yeah. So which they are asking for it? Oh, so so normally what happens with that is is once you bring that together, um, the audience that that you've you've brought together okay. asking for that information, right? So usually <clears throat> it can span from your product owners, it can span from your and again, it depends which layer you're working at there, right? If you're at the enterprise. Then you're obviously going to get some some questions from you. So, you know, we encourage CEOs and CIOs to be able to drop in on these information and look at it, right? So, right down to even the the engineers themselves might be saying, "Well, do they need this information? Because I don't think they understand." So, there's that. a lot of there's a lot of power mm -hmm. in visualization of the work, um, um, Anthony. I and to 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 Tony's point. We set up a portfolio with a client and they were doing strategic planning and strategic tracking of delivery across their entire organization and portfolio managers running it. He's got a big Kanban, he's got his big metrics and on there and once a fortnight, delivery leads from across the business coming in and talking about it. And then all of a sudden the CEO started turning up and A, the conversation changed. But after about a two maybe three sessions she came to three sessions and then she started cancelling a whole bunch of leadership team meetings out of people's calendars and it was really because that she was able to come to this session and get all the information she needed right at that point and she didn't need the other things anymore so you start to behavior the tool was able to and the quality of the updates and the quality I mean, when we talked about data and the, all of that sort of thing you know we're talking it's not a day you know you do it and then the next day you get the behavior shift obviously these things take time but um you start to see flow on benefits from freeing people up because the reporting needs dropped off because she got the information she needed straight away so yeah you can be really um you can get some really great advantages and really great um benefits out of it and if nothing else we all know we're all sick of being on video calls so um or in meetings and i'm a big fan of meetings being cancelled if they're not needed so yeah well, remember we talk about, you know, what can you do asynchronously versus synchronously? So this is the, the ability to provide asynchronous information, you know, uh, sorry, uh, async information that they can drag in, right? And then you can use that for a synchronous conversation. <clears throat> sorry. Did I miss the slide that shows the benefits? Yeah, you, you didn't miss it, Sheila, because there's not one. 
<laughs> we were just going to talk through it, Jill. <laughs> yeah, I think you need to add that, though, because the things that you're pointing out now are really important in, in getting people to buy into doing this and, and seeing the value in it for them. Good point. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, thanks for the feedback. Yeah. We can do that. Absolutely. We can take that on. Yeah, I guess the way we, we tend to structure these is conversationally, but uh, that is a good point, um, especially if, if it's going to be out there for people to see. Well, the reason I'd ask the question is I have met resistance when I've tried to do something similar. I haven't used your format, but I've used something similar. And I think until you can convince them that there's value for them, that it's going to save time, that it's not just busy work, it's yep. really difficult to get them to do it. And it's even more difficult when you're trying to have good asynchronous communication when you have a global team. Yeah, yeah, agreed, agreed. And yeah, I, I, I can concur. I, I, I worked on a very, very large program where it was like a $350 million program across three continents with multiple multiples of teams um, to get even the rudiments of, of this type of thing in place was the proverbial pushing it uphill for quite some time. What I did do and enabled me to get where I needed to go um, was luckily there was a couple of leaders who were I found that was simpatico and they let me do it. Once we started doing that, everybody else looked at it and went, what's going on over there? We want some of that. So sometimes it's just getting that foot in the door as well, Sheila. So I do acknowledge it's, it's you know, the, there's no genie moment, right? I don't look like I don't have the hair and I can't just go blink and make it happen. So sometimes there is a little bit of hard work around it. Any more questions? Um, only a small one, and it's uh, it's only because I didn't rock up at the start. So apologies. Um, I'm very curious about uh, if you were had any examples that you were had had shown as you went through. Um, just if you've got any examples, just uh, pop them up for about maybe a minute or so. I'd love to have a look. Oh, okay, I can. I just killed the. I just killed that too. <laughs> but then we, have record, we have recorded this, Anthony. So okay, cool. You'll be able to see those, but I can. I can do that. Just give me a moment. Talk amongst yourself while I play. Oh, that's all right. I just want to. <laughs> now I'm just let's see if it'll let me go back because it wasn't letting me play before. I really like that you talked about using the tools that are available in the environment, not yeah. you, not you know, using a specific tool, but looking to see what's available and legal in the environment in the organization you're working in, not trying to fit everybody into using one specific tool. Yeah, I think that was an interesting, thank you for that, Sheila. I think that the reason we did that is because when we first came out with the virtual buyer um, as part of the RAF thing, people were expecting us to come out with the tool. And that was never the, never the intention because one tool does not fit all. Um, and we certainly didn't want to be one of those, uh, shall we say, vendors or consultancies that says my tool is going to fix everything, right? Which is ostensibly it, the, the biggest thing, it works out of the box. Usually I put my skates on and start running that way because we know that that never happens. And then you've got lots of configuration. It's better to look in the environment, see what you can do. Yes. Mural and Miro and those things are out here and we know what they are and you could use these, but if you can't, exactly what you're saying, you have to you have to work with what you have. You can't just throw your hands up in the air and go, well, we can't do anything for you, right? Well, it's the change management side. I mean, I, I talked a little bit about it before <clears throat> as well. Um, yeah, and it's probably coming through. I, I, the, the biggest challenge we'll run in any of these is, is adoption. Like adoption is really, really, really hard. And if you... Um, bringing in a brand new tool that no one's ever seen and ask them to use it, you have to teach them how to use it. And then they have to find value and all these sorts of things. And um, Sheila, to your point, you know, people won't do it if they don't find value in it. So if all of a sudden I've said, hey, here's a brand new tool, you already don't believe there's value in doing what the tool is helping you do. And then I've got to teach you to adopt the tool and use the tool in a certain way. 
the adopt the, the 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 curve is too too steep and you'll just get huge amounts of pushback well the so other you, thing is yeah. just get the tool in-house a lot of times can take months in a big organization because you've got to go through management committees to get approval to bring in a tool then you've got to go through information security then you've got to go through procurement and yep. by the time you've done all that you've wasted six or eight months and you haven't really done anything yep yeah absolutely yeah yeah and look and it comes down to all of that <clears throat> even when you try to to attempt the 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 types of um you know all hands planning or pi planning big room planning and you're doing that in a digital environment <clears throat> That intrinsically, you should be thinking about how that links back into your Bayer so that you, it becomes a living board, right? One of the first organizations when we hit the pandemic and we got, you know, all, all sent home, we were, we were set to do a physical uh, a big room planning with, you know, 70 odd people across two continents. It was like, okay, well, how are we going to deal with that? Um, we had to use the native tools within that organization because we exactly what you're saying. We couldn't go out through procurement or anything or get those things because the, the lead time, we literally had four days or, or we we're going to have to abandon it. It wasn't pretty, but it worked. Um, and <laughs> amazingly enough, it's now a living board that still lives. And I've run many, many, many all hands plannings across the last 18 months remotely. <laughs> I can understand the challenge. You, Sheila, you, you you hit the money absolutely on the head with each of the questions. It's and they're they're the challenges and they're the things overcoming. There are no easy answers for them. It's by use a tool that's already there, you save time. Um, it goes back to what I was talking about before. Like sometimes getting just getting something up with the key piece of information right now yep. helps them solve that problem and then you kind of get the runs on the board or you get enough buy-in from the people you need buy-in for to, to bring in the next piece. And then you sort of, it grows generically or it grows, um, not generically, um, it grows granularly over a period of time and organically develops into to where you need to get it to. Yeah. It's the path of least resistance, right? Yeah. I, I did watch Bruce Lee's Be Water recently. So there's a bit of that <laughs> sort of flow around the, flow around the rocks. Um, Anyway. <laughs> Excellent. Anything else we can answer for you? Hopefully we can answer this. <laughs> Sounds like we might be good, John. I think we might be good, John. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for coming along. And of course, also a massive thank you to uh, Tony and David for taking us through that. It was uh, okay. some absolutely awesome stuff and great conversations came out the other end of it. Our pleasure. Yeah, our pleasure. Thanks, I'll, everyone. Uh, drop the recording. It's always a, always a, a 